Welcome to another edition of Talking Texas. We're going to be talking some Texas recruiting, some off-season talk, uh, a little bit of conference realignment maybe with Kieran Hickey Simple. Kieran, what's up, man? Good to see you. What's going on, Hudson? It is a pleasure being on the program, uh, listening to you, Mike, talk recruiting. Been uh, been, been, the, been the highlight of this off-season, to be honest with you. <laughs> so I I'm, mean, I'm very excited to be here. The, the past week or so, the past two weeks, honestly, have been nothing short of insanity. So, I mean, hey, let's talk some recruiting right now. Arch Manning's in the boat. It feels like they got a dozen other recruits right after him. I'll let you be the dealer. What's the choice? Where do you want to start off? We can start with Arch, or we can start with, you know, one of the other two five stars, one of the other, you know, six, four stars. Like, where do, where do we want to start this conversation? I think you I think you have to start with Arch to be honest with you. I mean like we we you just got to you got to you got to go right off the bat with with Arch Manning. I've never seen anything like what I've seen the past 2 3 weeks in in recruiting. For Texas, I mean the only thing that I could think of since I've been following recruiting closely would be like Charlie Strong, the 2015 class, the hashtag everybody when they were landed, <laughs> just people left right and center, but I haven't seen anything like it at all in in landing Arch Manning. To be honest with you, I, I kind of undersold it. I didn't really, I didn't really like. It didn't really resonate with me until I saw that graphic up. That okay, the worst drafted Manning of all time was taken number two overall, and that was Archie Manning. <laughs> so having the third generation Manning pick the University of Texas as his school to to go be developed into an NFL quarterback, huge. And and we've seen the the the, the trickle down effect. It's been crazy. I think I texted you that night, or if it wasn't that night, it was the next day on Friday that we were getting so many different reports from sources literally across the country of just like, you don't even know how many, you know, how this is going to go down. And then as we started to build into the official visit weekend, it was like, Okay, well, Anthony Hill's saying this. Uh, Derek Williams is saying this. Wait, they think that maybe, you know, Derek Williams could commit every <laughs> offensive lineman. So it's yeah. been true insanity. I think the next jumping off uh, spot when we're talking about Arch, though, before we get to the wave of commitments that followed, is just him as a player. I've talked about it with Gabe Brooks. Mike and I have talked about it. Shoot, Kieran, you and me have talked about uh, Arch's you know, athletic only pedigree when mm. I believe we were on with Steven, but Arch is a player. While he might not be on the exact same quarterback circuit as a lot of these other recruits in a loaded class, to be fair, the 2023 class at QB is absolutely loaded. It's ridiculous. We've talked about this. Exactly. We've talked about this before. Why should Texas fans give Arch that pass for maybe why he didn't go to the Elite 11, why he's not on the camp circuit as much as a, as a lot of these other kids. Yeah, well, I mean, I think the, the Elite 11 camp thing is getting overblown. His last name is Manning, and the Mass Manning Passing Academy was happening the, the same weekend. Obviously, he's going to be there with his family, you know, um, work, working at that camp. Uh, as far as the Elite 11 is concerned, I mean, I, I made a joke about this. I was saying, you know, why why care about getting the, the info and, and knowledge from Trent Dilfer when your uncles are Peyton and Eli Manning? <laughs> you know, like it at the end of the day, I think you're gonna be able to get what you need day in and day out with with the with the connections that the Manning family has as well. Um and I think that's really what the Elite Eleven is all about. Yes, the competition is is fierce. It's elite. It's it's the best that there is in, in terms of high school quarterbacks. I mean, we saw Justin Fields and Trevor Lawrence go at it, one of the best Elite Elevens I've ever seen. But I just think I, I think I think as far as giving him a pass, the dude's got pro development specialist all around him at all times. He has access to I'm sure he has access to David Cutcliffe whenever he wants to talk to him because he, they have such a close relationship as a family to David Cutcliffe as well. Um, I, I yeah, as far as the him missing out on the Elite Eleven, I think it's not really as big of a deal as, as possible. And I for the, for the Texas fans out there, don't get. Don't get don't get sucked into the to the Twitter arguments. You know what I mean? That's that's bait. Don't don't take the bait. I'll say that much. Here's one thing too, Kieran. You know how much I love uh, Jackson Arnold, for example. I love Nico Yamaliava, the quarterback who also missed uh, Elite Eleven because he was at a international volleyball tournament. Um, what I hate the most, kind of, about some of the discourse is tearing down one young quarterback to build yours up. I just I I don't like that. No. Like, 
all of these guys, like, it's an amazing year for 2023. Even watching a guy like Austin Novosad from Dripping Springs go out to the Elite 11 and dealing with the fact that he's a Baylor commit in Texas, A&M, Georgia, and Ohio State are going after him, and he still puts on a show and is likely going to get a rankings bump because of it. Their positive performances don't discount Arch, similar to how, I don't know, like Arch putting on a show at the Manning Passing Academy and being ranked number one overall doesn't mean that they're any less of a player. Like it's, you know, you have to make calls and there's a ton of talented 2023 QBs. And I just, that's one thing that's kind of bugged me throughout this uh, process a little bit. Yeah, I honestly, I, I, I completely agree with you. I think that just because Manning, uh, that, that's that's a huge name. Obviously, there's going to be comparisons to the rest of the quarterback class, and there's phenomenal talents everywhere. And like you said, you don't have to knock one kid down to praise another. Nico is insane. The dude's played two years of high school football, has like 55 touchdowns and two interceptions. You know, Malachi Nelson. In, I mean, I'm, I'm out here in LA. I cannot wait to go watch him play. Yeah, I, I'm I'm like him and and Nico. I'm excited to go watch play this fall. Uh, this this quarterback class is loaded. Jackson Arnold just won the Elite Eleven MVP. Oklahoma fans are going to let us hear about that for years, <laughs> like for for absolute, for for years and years and years to come. So this this quarterback class, in my opinion, is one of the best I've ever seen. It might be the best that I've seen since I'm following recruiting. Um, yeah, like it, it's like you said, you don't you don't have to knock any of these guys down to 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 praise any to the, like you don't have to knock anyone down to to praise the others. But when when it comes to Arch Manning as a player, though. I, after after looking at more and more film of him, after watching what he does, how he operates, I can't stress enough how perfect of a scheme fit he is for Sarkeesian's offense. Sarkeesian's peak offense, in my opinion, is what you saw in 2020 with Mac Jones. Smooth operator, going to go out there, get the ball into his playmaker's hands as quickly and efficiently as possible. And when Arch Manning does step on the field for the University of Texas, he is going to have an exuberant amount of talent around him, like just a crazy amount of talent. He's going to have freaking nine offensive linemen fighting to get to that starting, <laughs> starting rotation. Like it's, it's crazy. And I think, I think with, with his quick release, with his, with his pocket presence, which is in, incredibly underrated, to be honest with you, I think it's the strength of his game, how smooth and relaxed he is back there. It's, it, it's incredible, but I, I can't stress enough how much of a perfect fit he is for Steve Sarkeesian's offense. I, I was wondering how you felt about that. Yeah, I mentioned it with Gabe Brooks because uh, 24-7 Sports National Recruiting Analyst Cooper Patanga, who used to work as, uh, I believe, the DPP for a couple of Power 5 programs and had been in player personnel for a while, comped Arch to Joe Burrow. And I think when people hear that comp, it's like, because Joe Burrow is one of the you know fastest rising quarterbacks, it's a little bit of like, oh, tap the brakes. But what I think is so smart about that comparison is it's exactly what you said. It's not um, the arm strength or the ability to make plays outside of the pocket. It's the pocket presence itself that really makes me think Joe Burrow when I watch Arch Manning. And I think that is where having the Manning tutelage has helped him so much because he just has that feel in the pocket of, okay, there's a four man rush. I know to slide left, even though my eyes aren't even seeing it because I have that feel and doing that allows you to operate with a lot more five man protections. And so you mentioned one of the best offenses of all time in that 2020 Alabama offense I think a lot that, you know, Steve Sarkeesian can go to that 2019 LSU playbook as well eventually when it comes time for Arch Manning because you don't have to have these six and seven man max protections with him at QB. You can put five guys out in uh, running routes and he'll be able to go through the progressions, slide up in the pocket, avoid contact and make those throws because of that pocket feel. And because of the, you know, tremendous ball placement that he has on short all the way to, you know, third level throws. Mm. Yeah, I I think the kid is going to produce at a very high level whenever he gets in this in, in this scheme. And and I think I think a lot of people get wowed by the by the crazy arm strength, by the ability to roll out left. And I think me as a football fan and someone that, I mean, Rod Baber says it all the time, a football theorist. I'm trying to become more and more of a football theorist every single day. But seeing more and more football, 
I've, I've, I've grown to appreciate it a whole lot more. The nuance of the game. I'm, I, I gave Tom Brady his flowers recently, saying that, that he actually is the GOAT. I Big freaking you. can't stand him whatsoever. But, you know, it is what it is. Like, yes, Aaron Rodgers can roll outside of the pocket, launch a 40, 50-yard ball off, off balance, do all of that. But what Tom Brady is capable of doing, systematically just picking apart a defense, just piece by piece, going quick game, uh, uh, having having long drawn out play actions to to develop deep shots and they're things that he reads and checks into constantly like there's so many different things i i honestly wasn't a big fan of the the pocket passer in college football until i saw joe burrow completely destroy all of college football playing in a pro style offense with with i mean well i, I wouldn't classify it as completely pro style they still spread it out and we're, and we're dicing people up but yeah like pro pro concepts in in, in terms of of, of passing I think that's the perfect, and I know that we're going on a little bit of a tangent to start, but that's the mm-hmm. perfect example because what is traditional pro style versus college offenses kind of were obliterated around 2017, 2018, because a guy from the New Orleans Saints and Joe Brady came to college football and put all of these concepts out there. And you're right, they're pro concepts. These are three and four progression reads where you're having to truly analyze the defense like make again three and four seconds in the pocket these high um you know iq reads and it's a lot less of the old which i loved art briles veer and shoot where it's like hey you're either running inside zone or you're throwing a go like those are your two reads so i don't know kieran it's really exciting and i don't know i think that he's definitely lived up to the hype as far as the 2023 bell cow recruiter uh goes and i wrote about this i think that his perfect foil in the class is also in the boat now when you talk about recruiting kieran arch is uh the silent type of recruiter he's gonna be you know reaching out to recruits hitting them up on the phone but Five-star wide receiver John Tay Cook out of DeSoto is going to be on Twitter getting some <laughs> hashtag Ant Hill to Austin stuff yeah. going. He's going to be uh, shy. Like, I think he showed up to uh, Malik Muhammad's uh, family gathering on Sunday and was, you know, hitting him up about, okay, when are you going to Austin? Like, John Tay Cook is the public presence to Arches, Real G's Move in Silence, like lasagna type recruit. <laughs> 100%. Not even He's... mentioning that John Tay is a legit five-star that has one of the highest floors of any wide receiver in the 2023 class. And I think he's going to continue to get better as well. I mean, you saw, like, there, there's a video that he released recently, him and Evan Stork going out there. I mean, the, hey, and – as a content creator, I love what Jonte Cook is doing. The dude's gone viral three, four, five different times. Him and Evan Stewart going at it is And shout perfect. out to Jake, uh, Jake who does a lot of Jake Fisher, yeah. Stuff. Jake is Jake is really good at his job. Yeah, and and that's the thing too. Like like you said, Jonte is going to be that public uh, that 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 public figure recruiter that's going out there and, and preaching the propaganda, trying to get more of these kids in. You know, trying trying to trying to get more for the good guys and. And honestly, I think it was it was a big deal for us to lock up that commitment before the season started. Because I think if you go into the season with more momentum, that kid's only going to start talking more and more and more when when <laughs> hey when A and M is, is is struggling a little bit. You know what I mean? When when Evan Stewart's got you know like his his three catches like like he's like he's <laughs> like like uh, like Jonte is saying. I think I think he's gonna be he's gonna be pretty outspoken to the rest of these recruits. And and like you said. I, I love the fact that he's a DFW area kid, and that's where I think we, we could really lock up a lot of, a lot more of these kids. Like you said, Malik Muhammad, uh, he, he went to his family gathering, uh, and I'm sure he's in their ear, too. I love it. I love Jonte. As, as someone that grew up in Duncanville, right down the street, DeSoto, I, any kid from South Dallas, you know this. They're always gonna have they're always gonna have my support. So getting Jonte Cook, I wanted him for for a for a long, long, long time. Even from I I believe it was the scrimmage that he had. It was the scrimmage that DeSoto had against South Lake, and he was was performing well in that too. And I was like, man, who is this like sophomore going out here and and, and crushing stuff like this? Or I think he might have even been a freshman then. I'm not sure. I but, think it was a sophomore. I I, I believe yeah. that was the um, I believe that was the year. Yeah, but I mean the kid the kid's special, and I think he's only going to continue to get better as well. But you mentioned LSU a little bit earlier. We were talking about Arch Manning and, and, and quarterbacks in LSU. And, and just the state of Louisiana in general has, has surprised me this recruiting process. 
and landing Derek Williams came out of nowhere to me. I did not like, I just, that was like, that was the one moment where I was really skeptical about it. I was like, okay, yeah, Arch Manning's here. We'll, we'll have like, you know, some momentum. I don't think it's going to just get us in the door with all of these kids out of, out of nowhere. Boom. Five-star Derek Williams commits. Here's the fun thing about Derek Williams. Mike had had a couple of sources all spring going, look, they're going to get Derek Williams. And it was like, oh, okay, like, sure, you know, we'll see when his, you know, timeline eventually comes. Like, he's a five-star out of Louisiana that Alabama's pushing for, like, and that LSU, you know, traditionally gets. Like, we'll see. And then (laughs) one of the first – actually, I'd say probably, like, third or fourth call that we got uh, from a source during our drive to College Station after we had infamously spent, like, three hours on the side of the road just, you know – doing podcasts, content, everything, (laughs) was like, yo, I'm thinking that Tony Mitchell, the safety out of Alabama, uh, safety corner out of Alabama, is going to commit to Alabama. That might be a domino that gets Derek Williams to pull the trigger to Texas pretty soon. That was like at the beginning of his official visit. So we were like, okay, let's monitor this closely. And then I believe that Sunday night before he committed on Monday or whatever the night before, uh, Mike was on vacation, and I just got a text from a source that was like, yo, you better have something ready on Derek Williams. It's like, oh. Wow. Yeah, Kieran, just... when, when you talk about um, the Texas recruiting atmos- like landscape, I genuinely don't think, like, other than Arch Manning, I do think Derek Williams is the biggest thing that's happened this cycle. I love Jonte. I think that he's deserving of five-star composite status, but... Mike did the audio for the Jonte commitment video. Like we kind of knew that Jonte was gonna, yeah. The Texas club. Derek, you can Williams. even see in that video, Jonte was saying, "I think I think most people like have a good idea that that I'm going to Texas." Exactly. You know? Derek Williams, who is a true bona fide five star that could play box safety, safety, or linebacker at the college level. He's such a rangy athlete that can kind of do it all. That is the type of dynamic secondary presence that when you are moving into the sec which we'll probably talk about a little bit later having one of those guys on the team makes it a little bit easier to you know run cover three buzz or like whatever you want to do uh on your backfield yeah no i mean he's he he can do everything first of all he's an athlete back there at safety he's 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 fast he's physical but it's really the physicality coming downhill I, I loved that about B.J. Allen's game last year. It was my favorite thing about his game. I was like, man, that kid is a thumper. Like, I think he's going to be able to get – I still believe. I think he's going to be able to get some time in, in – he's going to be able to get himself in the mix this year. I just I, – I, I think he is, especially later on down the season. I think you, you're, you're going to see him – you're going to see him start getting in, into some package plays or, or, or something like that. I don't know. I just – I love the kid coming downhill. When I saw – when you cut on Derrick Williams' film, you're seeing him blow – kids up it's phenomenal it's phenomenal and 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 i i don't think we've had we've had we've had that sort of safety play that i think he's capable of of course we've recruited well at safety in the past i mean you got three of the top four safeties in the country in 2018 but i'm excited to see what this staff can do from a development standpoint with a kid as talented as Derek williams is because man getting a kid like that out of louisiana it's incredible and i just i think i i would i actually would agree with you Outside of Arch, I think that is probably the biggest get that we've gotten in, in this recruiting cycle. I mean, Jonte, yes. But I don't want to take Jonte for granted whatsoever. For sure. Jonte is insane. And, yes, like, like you said, I think he's going to finish. I think he might finish as a top 20 player in the country, to be honest with you. That's how, that's how much of a rise I think he's going to have, not only on the football field, but just in, in the camp settings. What, wherever he has to go play, he's going to perform extremely well this year. Um, but yeah, man, Derek Williams. God, what a, what a land. Here's a fun lead for you. It is the biggest non-arch recruiting development so far because, you know, Texas is really starting. And we'll talk about a, probably a couple more commits, but I do just want to throw that out there. Mm. Texas is trending pretty well for Anthony Hill, the number one linebacker in the country, a true five-star, like, war daddy type recruit, in addition to 
other Dallas Fort Worth area, you know, superstar players that are top 50 in Malik Muhammad and JV and Tobiano from Dallas South Oak Cliff and Arlington Martin, respectively. So hmm. Texas is in that spot recruiting right now where they do have the hype, like they're the school that kids are talking about. Um, I mentioned it today in a note, but like Anthony, Anthony Hill, they feel good. They feel good about Malik Muhammad. I had a random recruit committed to another school and the top 247 hit me up that was just straight up like, hey, I don't know what you're hearing, but it's my read that JV and Tobiano is going to end up in Texas. So when you're hearing from, you know, a vast, uh, you know, different amount of sources in different spots um, and it's all uh, coming up Texas, I mean, it's pretty exciting. Yeah. And and honestly – like I was saying about the DFW area, I think what you got in Arch Manning in terms of the offensive momentum that you had recruiting-wise, there are four players in the DFW area. If you land all four of them, that's probably the best class that I've seen since I've been following recruiting for the, for, for, for the University of Texas. You got JV and Toviano in the DFW area, Malik Muhammad. You got Anthony Hill. And then later on, because we know he's going to end up committing later, I think, somewhere around... I have no clue when, but uh, DJ Hicks, like it, those four in the DFW area, elite ball players, elite ball players on the defensive side. And I think they give you, you get a commandment from any for any of those four, they give you an incredible boost on the defensive side of the ball. And then I start, I think you start seeing that, that uh, the, the Anthony Hill effect or the Malik Muhammad effect or the JV and Toviano effect, whichever one of them pulls the trigger first. I, I want to see all three of those kids, actually all four of those kids in this class, but defensively, I think it's going to take that, that one of those four to really get things going for Texas on the defensive side of the ball. And I will just quickly so that nobody gets upset in the YouTube comments, which are normally a pretty reasonable and kind place. Unironically, I mean that for our show. Mm -hmm. Most people are pretty nice. Uh, DJ Hicks did transfer to Katie Paytow. So while he was at Allen, no, all good. I don't know, man. It's interesting. Are there any other commits that you want to talk about? I want to talk about one more just because uh, at least one more just because um, Mike and I really were all over this yeah. um, with Leona Leifau, who was probably the least impacted by Arch and Jeff mm-hmm. Choate. I had mentioned on a couple of different shows, like, yo, behind the scenes, Jeff Choate is doing a really good job. And, Choate the goat. And right now he has Samaje Burrell, Leona Leifau, two really good linebackers, and Texas looks great for Darian Gallette and is – probably leading right now, if not in a really close 50-50 for Anthony Hill with a Texas A&M. Like, th- that's pretty insane. Yeah, he's he's done amazing work. And, and Leona Leifau, I mean, from what I from what I hear, I love the kid's mentality. I no. think the kid is a dog, man. <laughs> like, he, he really is. And and honestly, I think I think locking up more of these linebacker commits, it's, it's, a, it's been a position of weakness, let's be honest here. Even when you look at the roster now, it's still – a position of weakness that we've had. I mean, we're bringing in uh, Diamante Tucker Dorsey uh, coming back. Hey, he's probably going to have to end up playing significant snaps for us this year, which, I mean, he's a ball player. He really is, and I'm excited to see it. But we need those elite linebacker recruits, and it's something that I don't think Texas has really had. And also, I mean, from from a high school perspective, it's not a position that, that's that been – I wouldn't say it's been a position of strength for the state of Texas in general. For sure. Um, it's one of the rare years where – you can find, you know, probably a half dozen, if not more, like legit linebacker takes. Not even mentioning that the cream of the crop with like Anthony Hill and um, Darian Gillette is as elite as they are. Yeah, and and the thing with Leona Le- like Lafau, he's coming downhill so hard. He he is that enforcer in the run game that I, we didn't have last season. And I am so unbelievably excited to see because these are the same type of guys that Choten PK went out there and got from Utah, from 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 the West, you know what I mean? Well, from from Hawaii, mm-hmm. and developed into phenomenal All Conference players year after year after year at Washington. And I can't believe we're doing it at Texas now. And also, I mean, what we really haven't had a big Polynesian presence, yeah, at the University I- of Texas, and and him being the forefront of that, it's a huge opportunity for him. And, and, and the entire Polynesian community, in my opinion, too. I, I'm very excited to see if he if he is the 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 spearhead of of, yeah. of the of the of this influx of Polynesian talent that we that we hopefully get in. And and Kieran, they really pitched Leona on being the trailblazer for 
potential future Polynesian linebackers at Texas. And that was something that I think they just kind of nailed from like a psychological aspect on the recruiting pitch and the official visit because Oregon and Utah were kind of essentially, and I'm dumbing down, of course, what was a well put together pitch, but they were essentially like, look, you're the next up in the long line of, you know, elite Polynesian linebackers that we send to the league. And Texas kind of zigzagged and was like, no, we don't have a history of putting a bunch of, you know, Polynesian linebackers into the league, but you can be the first. And I think we, you talked about Leona's mentality. I think that kind of, you know, got that dog in him alpha mentality for Leona. It was <laughs> like, yeah, I love that. I, I want to be a part of that. So yeah. he mentioned, though, something that I think is the best uh, – one of the best quotes about Arch in the class where he was like, look, I saw it and I loved it because that just makes me further believe in Steve Sarkeesian's vision as a program. Like I committed to Texas for these reasons. It wasn't Arch related, but that does give me that faith in his vision. Um, we talked about John Tay Cook. They also got a pledge from Jonah Wilson recently, the wide receiver out of spring to Caney to pair with Ryan Niblett. Now, I believe an hour ago, they missed out on um, a top 50 overall player in Jaquez Petaway from Langham Creek High School. Lovely kid who I think is an absolute baller, ends up at OU. Now, you kind of have an interesting road for the rest of the wide receiver takes. It's probably going to be four or five. They look great for Mikel Harrison Pilot, but he wants to, wants to keep a longer timeline and potentially decide in December. They've started to surge for Jalen Hale out of Longview, which is incredibly exciting development. But, <laughs> yes. you know, Jalen's a little bit of a wild card with how he handles his uh, process, so there's no clarity on timeline there. You know, how special, you know how special this Arch Manning stuff is? Because I have been the most pessimistic person you've probably known on Jalen Hale this entire recruiting process, and now I'm starting to actually believe we have a shot at landing him. Like, I... This entire time, I really just haven't been big on it. And and like you said, Jaquez Petaway choosing OU, it does open up some things. Um, it is a miss, though. It is a miss. It it, yeah. it definitely it definitely hurts. The, the kid is incredibly talented. We're talking about what is he a ten six guy in the hundred meter dash? He, it's, he had three uh, ten fours and he had a twenty point eight two hundred. So like as verified as you. <laughs> oh my goodness, great! Any kid going sub twenty one in the two hundred yeah. meter dash in, in in high school football has elite speed like elite elite speed um yeah i i it's interesting to see where this goes um obviously mhp Mikel uh, harrison pilot pushing pushing his uh his recruitment later it does it does kind of hurt things a little bit but i'm interested to see what the board looks like come december whenever he comes around it, it, will we have more to pitch will he um be more open i guess to playing both sides of the ball and, and can Texas get him off that timeline and shut it down a little bit early? That's another interesting thing. Like, I'm sure they're going to push hard for him to uh, come to Austin at the end of the month for once the dead period ends. And can they get him on campus and be like, look, I know that this is when you want to have your timeline, but, you know, we're trying to get stuff wrapped up. Another thing narrative-wise, I wrote about this. Texas has a legit pathway if they can get another flurry of commitments before the season starts to roll into the year and have that Alabama game in the, you know, what it's probably going to be like 109 in Austin uh, around, you know. Oh, I keep forgetting that game's at 11, man. <laughs> Why? Part of the package could be for the narrative of the game is, hey, Texas isn't there yet, but they could have the number one recruiting class in the country at the time with the number one player in Arch Manning and really sell that to where then just a respectable performance turns into Texas has the number one recruiting class and the number one player in the country. You know, whoever's at quarterback, if they have a good showing. And you can really build the narrative of, okay, Steve Sarkeesian – has this under control and is truly going to build something at Texas. And, you know, recruits are going to be watching that game. There's going to be a ton at the game. Like, we haven't even mentioned the fact that Deuce Robinson, the number one tight end in the country and a true five-star out of Arizona, is going to officially visit for that game. Like, that's a major development that we I have. I think it's very telling that that was the game that he chose to, to, to attend as well. Exactly. 
Now, I've said this a bunch, but it's worth repeating just because, you know, pe- sometimes people only watch one show. I don't think that Texas will be able to get the number one class in the country by National Signing Day 2. I, just looking at the math, it's going to be a little hard for Texas to get done. I think that they'll finish top three, um, but number one seems a little rich for me right now. The point I'm making, though, is that narrative-wise, you can build the case during the season of having the number one class. And if Texas looks promising, that's a ton to build off of. Yeah, 100%. And also, I mean, speaking of, of, of class rankings, though, too, uh, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't mention Kyle Flood just going all out and just being like, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and get up my entire offensive line class in a day. I don't like, you know what, it is what it is. Like, I'll just get, well, I think we're going to end up taking one more, likely. It's likely sure. that we end up taking one more. But to get four out of the five that you probably take, Exactly. After a, after a year that you took seven, pitching yeah. all these kids on development too. I mean, um, if you know me, you know I frequent Twitter spaces where people get players in trouble and stuff like that. <laughs> but um, no, hey, we were talking to uh, Trevor Goosby's dad and just talking about the, the, what the pitch from Kyle Flood is, and and honestly, even speaking last year to to, to former players like uh, like Toby Amade, like just saying like, dude. It's ridiculous the level of development and the way that they approach the game. Um, Michael Goosby, uh, Trevor Goosby's dad, just saying like I, I played in the NFL and and to hear the way that Sarkeesian and Kyle Flood talk about the game, it's very pro, very pro centric, very pro development heavy, and that's something that I've been begging, just absolutely, just hoping, <laughs> praying to God that that we had a class or not not a class, a coaching staff that that prioritized pro development more than anything else. And and that's what I think this this uh this bunch has. And and I think all of these kids are phenomenal evaluations. I mean, you're talking about Kojo, who's 15, 16 years old. How old is he right now? He's 15? So he's 16. And 16 the stat that I always throw out is Kojo's going to enroll at Texas, you know, if he ends up signing there, which he should, uh, when he's 16 years old. So he'll have a full year of strength and conditioning before he turns 18. And when you think about the fact that, like, a lot of kids, right, like, a lot of kids enroll late in the summer and turn 19, like, he'll have two full years of strength and conditioning by the time that he catches up to a lot of college freshmen. Like, that's That's just, that's the upside to where, yeah, he does have a lower ranking, but you can really see it with Kojo and even, you know, with Stroh and Goosby, they all have the pathway to end up maximizing. And, oh, mm-hmm. Jaden Chapman's just a win over Alabama, LSU, and Texas A&M. Exactly. And Oklahoma, exactly. too. Yeah, and, pe- and, and that's that's the thing, too. I mean, I even heard, like, Steve Wolfong uh, talking about it yesterday, just saying Texas is going out there and we are doing something that we haven't done since, honestly – probably the Vince Young years, like going out there and out recruiting big time programs for big time offensive line recruits and, and, and trench players. That's yeah. Trench players. Cause you know, on the defensive side of the ball, they came out of nowhere and got Sadir Mitchell out of Bergen Catholic in New Jersey from Georgia, where he was, you know, assumed to be going throughout the entire spring. I had so many different sources after both Sadir Mitchell visits, just be like, look, Bo Davis and Kyle Flood, and Kyle Flood recruiting Sadir Mitchell because Flood has a ton of ties to New Jersey and New York. Mm. But Rutgers. List, yeah, exactly. Look, Bo Davis and Kyle Flood crushed it. I don't know what else they need to do, but it's just we're still here in Georgia. Then, that's, a good, that's a good tandem in the recruiting trail, though, too, now that I oh, think about it. Man, I mean, it's a phenomenal if tandem. Get, if they don't get some sort of, like, duo comedy show, like, what are we doing? <laughs> yeah, any exactly. of the Texas creatives that are listening, please just you know get a couple stills of them back to back like yeah. that. We need some. What was it called? Like uh, on Instagram, the Texas raw footage. We need some. We need some more Kyle Flood and Bo Davis content yeah, for sure. Shooting the breeze, one hundred percent. But then the arch stuff happens, and you know we're hearing a little bit more like, oh, they might actually be in it for Steer Mitchell. And then I see <laughs> on an Instagram live of John Day, Derek Williams, and Trey Wisner. Just this comment from Sadir or Mitchell that's like, uh, not going to lie, let's do it. And mm. immediately, I kind of discounted it because it's like, okay, you know, kids are always doing the like, oh, I'm going to shock the world. Like, yeah. But then he literally went and did it. And yeah. that... Well, Harrison Pilot said, if, if Arch commits, I'll commit to Texas right now. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. That's why you kind of can discredit some of those. But... 
you know, Sadira Mitchell literally went out and uh, did it. And man, the call went, the call uh, when we heard like, Leo, he's a silent, he's, you know, wrapping it up. He's going to announce on CBA, uh, CBS uh, Sports HQ. That was another pretty wild moment. Because again, uh, 89 from 24-7 Sports. But when you think about it in the context of Sadir Mitchell is a true nose tackle. You know, he Gabe Brooks uh, mentioned a really good point that he only has six sacks in three years. That's partially because, you know, the, the role that they have him playing at Bergen Catholic and how effective he is at it. I mean, he's a double team getter. He's yeah, a double he, team attractor. 100%. Yeah. I, I love to, Gabe said that he's a gravitational void, which is the perfect way to put it. <laughs> and he's going to be a type of guy that Leona Leifau is going to love because. Sadir Mitchell is going to eat up two blocks on every single play. And sure, he's not going to have the pass rush upside, but you kind of don't need him to. No. You know, I, and, and that's the thing. It's, it's, the, it's what Keandre Coburn was so good at, that Chris Nelson was so good at in, in, in Todd Orlando's system. Not, not to, I mean, I know Texas fans hear Todd Orlando's name and they're like, what? You know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> but, immediately exit stream. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah exactly. Yeah, no, I, there, he's a space eater, like you said, and 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 he's someone that's going to be able to to go out there and really, really get things done um, for all like on that on that defensive line and allowing allowing these linebackers that we have, and I think we're going to have some really solid elite linebackers in this class. Like I just I feel it. That might just be me, just like desperately hoping that we get Anthony Hill because I remember saying it to you months ago. Like. I don't think people understand Anthony Hill is a generational talent in the state of Texas. The fact that there there's not been an inside linebacker in the state of Texas that has had this sort of profile coming out of high school. Of course, there's been guys that have been developed. I mean, hell, sure. Malcolm Rodriguez was playing quarterback and then ended up terrorizing the Big 12 for 17 years or whatever at Oklahoma State. <laughs> uh, Kenneth Murray, another incredible talent. But what what Anthony Hill projects to be, I think that's that's something that Texas needs desperately. I think he's a future first rounder. He all the tools all the gifts, all the specialty, whatever you want to you want to say, all all the dressing, he has all of it. And man, if getting a guy like Sadir Mitchell to to open up some space for him and Leona Leifau to come downhill, ooh, we're talking about something special right there. Exactly. And real quick on Ant too. The crazy thing about Ant is he has an old school linebacker build to where if you are looking at the modern linebacker, they don't come really built like Anthony anymore. And I think that's why you saw a lot of hesitation about, okay, well, is he an edge? Is he this? He's just that freak of all freak athletes that can be built at a true six foot two, 225 in high school, but he's not overdeveloped. And, oh, do I have proof that he's not overdeveloped? How about the fact that he ran third leg on Denton Ryan's sub 41, four by 100 meter relay that got second at 5A in Texas, you know, probably the best track state, if not second best to Florida, depending on who you yeah. talk to. Like, as far as the depth, though, it's 100% Texas is, is there. I mean, you're talking to Dunkinville alone, you know, exactly. state champions, by the way, 100 so, and 4 by one but. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that's what we're talking about, too. It's not just that Anthony Hill has two-way snaps. Again, Texas high school football 5A for one of the best programs. It's that he's built like that traditional mold that you kind of don't see anymore, but all of that is good weight, and he's able to still show multi-sport ability. Like, it's just crazy. Mm -hmm. Needless to say, um, I mean, Texas recruiting's on fire right now, and we kind of don't expect it to stop anymore. Mike and I will have more on recruiting in the uh, State of Recruiting podcast that we'll uh, record on Thursday and then post on Friday. Kieran... Before we head out, a little uh, off-season football talk. I, I Every time um, I'm talking to sources, the first thing that comes up is those freshman offensive linemen. Um, with, Don't you know, do it to me, man. DJ Don't Campbell do it to me. Elvin Banks looking good. I heard a, I, there was something funny to where it was like, look, Cam Williams is shedding all of this bad weight, and he's starting to look amazing, and Neto is just stacking on good weight. So, we, we're hearing a lot of good stuff um, about the freshman offensive linemen. What, is there anywhere else that you'd like to start the quick offseason talk? So the more we talk about the freshman offensive linemen, the more hesitant I get, but also 
I, man, I just want to down a giant cup of Kool-Aid whenever we start talking about them because I know that they're just they're unbelievably talented, especially Devon Campbell, Kelvin Banks, uh, Cam Williams, phenomenal evaluation. I love that, by the way. I was going to be really upset if we ended up losing them out to Oregon in the end of it all. Um, it, I'm really interested to see how – how these how these how these young DBs are, are developing? To be honest with you, now I think we're going to have a really veteran presence in the in the in the defensive back room, but building towards the future and also depth is very important. I I I, I think when you're talking about Terrence Brooks, B.J. Allen, Austin Jordan showing up too, I think he's a talented player as well. Um, what have you heard from 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 about these young DBs? I've heard a lot of really good things, especially about Terrence Brooks. He has the advantage of course of the fact that he was an early enrollee and i think that right now most of the summer enrollees their heads are spinning a little bit because Mm -hmm. it's new you're not doing football related stuff you're in the sand pit all the time um it's tough i think what's crazy though is that it seems like kyle flood had nailed the evaluation so well I don't hear negative things about any of the freshman uh, offensive linemen, and that's not an echo chamber, I don't think. Like, I think that mm. people are just giving their uh, normal evaluations. They're like, look, they're crushing it. What else can I kind of say? Now, when the pads come on, we'll really find out. But mm. mixed on the defensive backs, um, you know, and shoot, Kieran, I think that it's worth mentioning too, like, if you're a defensive back or a linebacker um, in the 2022 class, like you better get as much capital as you can with these coaches by, you know, busting your tail, even if it's not um, starting right away, don't put yourself in a position to where, you know, a Derek Williams or a, you know, potentially down the line, like a, if a Malik Muhammad, a JV and Toviano and Anthony Hill come into class, that's exactly where I'm coming from because I think those these these guys in this 22 class, especially in the defensive backfield, are looking at this situation that we have going on right now, and and it's also concerning for me coming up into the season because I I really I mean injuries are a part of football. I think yeah. we're one play away from having to play some young guys that that might not be ready for that for that for that time. And and as we saw in the 2019 season, I know Tex fans might not want to talk about it. It's really tough, but you had a lot of injuries there. And you had to ended up playing. Yeah, end up playing a lot, a lot of young guys that weren't really ready to go. So I think development there, and the fact that we got a lot of those guys in in the spring was was paramount to me. Absolutely. Um, another thing, I do hear a ton about Brennan Thompson. They seem to be pretty excited about just his uh, ability as a chess piece. I think I don't think that Brennan is going to get uh, feature snaps, but having him on uh, Sarkeesian's chessboard is a really intriguing uh, thing. Um, something I'm just excited about too is overall what the wide receiver room looks like and what we're hearing about that. That's, that's something that I do think fans maybe, um, when you're looking at the, doing your rewatch of the 2021 season, if you can bear it, I I've watched the Louisiana game like seven times. I can't get to the Arkansas game yet. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, but, well, when, when it comes to this, to this, to the offensive weapons, right? I have a hot take that I've spit a couple of times. I'm not sure if I've spit it to you. I definitely have a hot on this takes platform. are actually hot too. You're not a person yeah. that's like, hey, hot take. Uh, Bijan Robinson's good. <laughs> no, what? no. My hot take is, I believe this team offensively right now, like the, the offensive side of the ball for the, for the Texas Longhorns this season, is the most talented that we have had since Cedric Benson was on campus. Goodness gracious. You yeah, that, that that is a little hot for me, but it's also, hot. but also you could uh, you could get the Doctor Manhattan uh, meme treatment if people clip this after Texas finishes second in adjusted offensive EPA, or you know after the season ends. Well, I I, I legitimately think that this is I will, since I've been watching this Texas team, I, I I legit think they are more talented on the offensive side of the ball than the 2005 national champions. Definitely. I definitely think they are. I, like, listen, that sounds really hot. I know. When you're, I looking, know, I know. When you're looking at upside, right, you have, you have B. John Robinson, the unquestioned best running back in the, in the, in the country, a projected top 15 pick, right? You got Xavier Worthy, going to be a top five wide receiver, had incredible freshman production. You, I, I think people 
really undersell the fact that we got a thousand yard receiver and and brought him into this scheme now that I think is going to utilize his skill sets even better than than they were used at Wyoming. Yeah. And you get a Jordan Whittington back. You get you get you, you throw in Jatavian Sanders, my boy Jatavian. Shout out to Jatavian. You throw in Jatavian Sanders into the mix. You get Jaleel Billingsley, one of the best receiving tight ends in the country. Oh, well, upside wise, I think I think, I think he has he has, sure. he has yeah. all of that upside. I, I think this offense, and and you couple that with the fact that you're going to have a starting quarterback of either Quinn Ewers or Hudson Card, who are incredible talents and, and two of the highest rated quarterbacks we've had in the past 10, 10 15 years. Like, I, I legit think that talent wise, this team is more talented, in my opinion, than, than most of the teams that we've seen throughout, it, it, definitely more talented than the teams that we've seen throughout Texas's downfall. I'm, I'm very comfortable in saying that it is the, it, you know, and again, I'm a little bit more conservative when it comes to just making the preseason takes because, you know, I'm afraid of the old takes is exposed. I'm, I'm afraid that they're going to clip me and, you know, I'm going to look like Boo Boo the Clown. But, I, <laughs> Boo Boo the Fool. You boo-boo the look fool. like Boo the Fool. Yeah. But I think that when you look at it, the, since the Garrett Gilbert, era the you know uh Dep- great depression era of texas longhorns football it's not like it's the little jordan humphrey led team with sam ellinger and um you know colin johnson that's mm-hmm. the only one in that era that's even close when you're straight up looking at it as okay Bijan robinson likely to potentially the you know former number one player in the nation quinn ewers at qb Xavier Worthy, Isaiah Nayor, and then Jordan Whittington as the third option, and your four and five at wide receiver are also talented. You might base out of personnel with two really good tight ends that we've only heard great stuff about with the spring. And the problem does circle back to whether those freshman offensive linemen can contribute and make that impact to truly get them to that elite status and a potential top five offense, which we kind of think that that's where they should be, especially if Texas wants to, you know, contend for a Big 12 title. My thing is, and I say we probably wrap up on this, taking it to the scheme department. Yes, it's this way on paper, but if the base of Steve Sarkeesian's offense, which is inside zone, if that can't be run because, you know, maybe Devon Campbell's not ready or maybe... You know, the interior offensive line just can't get a consistent push against the level of, you know, defensive linemen they're going against. Does it all crumble and, you know, does Texas kind of end up in a similar situation to last year to where it's not built for super sustained success, just the explosive plays in first halves? So my thing with Steve Sarkeesian, especially this year offensively, I'm I am such a strong believer in our success this year. Because what I have seen from Steve Sarkeesian in the 2019 and 2020 seasons was incredible multiplicity. You have four first-round wide receivers in 2019, and you base out of 10 personnel a lot. Because you got to have four of those guys on the field. That, especially in, in big-time money downs. Why would I not have Judy, Ruggs, Waddle, yeah. Smith all on the field at the same time? The next year, you have Jalen Waddle go down, and you saw him run 12 personnel and dice people up through the air time yeah. and time and time again. So I think... I think what, what, what you're going to see this year is, is I think, I think unfortunately for Texas fans, we're going to see a lot of experimenting early on, especially yeah. if you have a new quarterback. That's just what it's going to, that's what it's going to be. But I think throughout the season, you're like Steve Sarkeesian is going to find what he's comfortable with, what he can run. And maybe that's the quick passing game because our offensive line isn't where it needs to be just yet. Maybe our offensive line is moving people and we can base out of that inside zone and, and, and create play action shots and run the complete Sarkeesian system then. But I think why he was so adamant on bringing in wide receivers and, and, and elite talent all around the ball is because he wants, that, multi- he wa- he wants that, that chance to be multiple. If he has to, I think he can base out of 10 personnel. Bring a Jai, bring a Jai Hall on the field. Put, put, put him and Isaiah Nair on the boundary. Try guarding that. Try guarding that. You know what I mean? Like, like bring, bring Brennan, bring uh, Brennan Thompson on the field. Run him in motion. Try guarding that. That's that. That to me is 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 where Steve Sarkeesian's strength is. I I don't see this defense. I, I'm sorry. I don't see this offense failing. And and also, when you hear Steve Sarkeesian talking about how diverse 
and 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 how many different ways he can use Bijan Robinson yeah. out of pistol. You can you can base out at a ten personnel run like an old Urban Meyer type spread, and and he can he can take off. It's we have so many different ways of beating you now, and I think Steve Sarkeesian is just the guy to exploit whatever weaknesses there are. And Kieran, here's how crazy versatile Texas is. Texas can go empty from 12 personnel. Yes. Like, oh my God. Yes. Like, like, that was one thing we heard from some scrimmages was like, yo, they have this 12 personnel empty look where they can they can put two tight ends and Bijan out wide and just absolutely dice people up. Because then if you put Bijan in motion, you're into a heavy running set. And, and you have to match numbers. Exactly. It's a nightmare. So, it's That's, a nightmare. That is what is super exciting about this offense and why um, I didn't immediately leave the stream when you had that Cedric Benson uh, <laughs> uh, offense take. Because Ooh. you do have the pieces in place to where if everything maximizes, it could be special. And even if the defense can't perform at that level right away, you know, you saw uh, Lincoln Riley's Oklahoma teams do it where, hey, if you have a top two offense in the country – you know, you can kind of just outscore people on your way to a conference title. It's really exciting. As you can tell, with 59 days until kickoff, we are just chomping at the bit to get uh, the Louisiana Monroe Warhawks at DKR. Kieran, I appreciate your time. Won't be the last time that you're on Talking Texas. Appreciate you so much, man. Thank you so much for having me on. This was a blast. Um, more hot takes to come. I'm just, I'm just warning you guys. More hot takes to come. Thanks a ton. And thanks to Taylor for making sure that uh, the YouTube video and the podcast is um, all good and everything. Thanks, guys. I'll see you all on the state of recruiting.